Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So if you need to go back in the foyer and get your communion cup, I'll give you just a second to do that. Um, But this was the Passover. Uh, Passover season is coming very quickly. And uh, the Lord was using that Jewish um, festival, that feast, that remembrance that God commanded them to do every year, and he changed the symbolism behind it. So the matzah bread was a symbol of his body, and then the wine or the, the juice that was in the cups was a symbol of his body. Now, if you've never sat through a Seder, it can last two to three hours, so aren't you glad communion doesn't last that long? But right to the point, um, that matzah bread is without leaven. Leaven is a symbol of sin in the scriptures. So Christ had no sin. Uh, The matzah is perforated and he was pierced. It is striped, by his stripes we're healed. Uh, It is bruised and he was bruised uh, for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And so that's the symbolism of his body being broken for us. And then also um, the juice is the symbol of his blood. The blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. And uh, we're going to do this with him in his kingdom. And uh, praise the Lord that we'll get to do this uh, with Christ present one day and all of the gathered church from all the different generations of the church. Uh, What a joyous day that will be. And he, he is coming. And so let's just take a moment and prepare our hearts, and then we'll go ahead and partake of uh, the wafer and uh, thank the Lord that uh, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your blood cleanses us from all sin. Thank you that you paid the penalty for our sin by bearing the weight and the penalty of the justice and the holiness of God uh, upon your human body. Thank you that you bore our sins and your body on the tree. That is a work that only you could do. Thank you that you are our perfect and qualified substitute. Thank you that you become our absolute righteousness and our full payment for sin. So, Lord, as we take this solemn moment to remember what you did for us, it is with gratitude and joy in our hearts that we uh, sit in your presence today, thanking that you are with us. And, Lord, thank you that your body was broken for us so that we could be with you forever. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may uh, remove your masks. Take your little cups and pull that uh, cellophane lid back and grab the wafer out of there. Okay. Do this in remembrance of him. He says, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Let's go ahead and prepare our cups now. Well, they took the cup and he gave thanks. So once again, uh, this is not just a second prayer that we do meaninglessly. Uh, but it is a genuine prayer of thanksgiving for what he has done for us. So let's give thanks for a shed blood. Jesus, thank you for your shed blood. 
that we are redeemed not with silver and gold received by vain traditions, passed down to us through religious ceremonies and traditions. But Lord, thank you that we are redeemed with the precious blood of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Thank you for your sinless and perfect life that becomes not only our substitute and our righteousness, but the full cleansing and full payment for our sin. In your precious name, we thank you for your cleansing blood. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of him. Well, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's um, open them up today to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to look at uh, the names of God today in our series. The name of God that we're looking at today is the Alpha and Omega. The Alpha and Omega. Now, have you ever heard someone described as he or she knows everything from A to Z? Have you ever heard that expression? All right, how many of you have ever made A to Z bread? Really? Only a couple of people? Really? That's all? Anyone else? Come on. A to Z bread. All right. So go home, watch the replay, and at the end of it, Matt, make sure that the uh, A to Z bread recipe slide is shown, at least for a couple of seconds at the end of the message. And um, there's a little treat for you. All right. The scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, maybe this will remind you of the message here, but A to Z bread. So... Um, Whatever you throw in it, from apples or apricots to zucchini, uh, you can throw anything into that bread recipe, and it should be good. Enough butter and sugar makes anything good, right? But now here's uh, the definition of what A to Z means. Uh, it can mean a map of the street maps of most British towns and cities Properly, the geographer's A to Z street atlas. So did you know that was an official definition of A to Z? <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, as a noun, all facts related to a subject. Uh, an encyclopedic or comprehensive guide to a particular subject. An alphabetical order or lexical order. And so you look through your dictionary, beginning with the letter A to the letter Z. Uh, it can be from beginning to the end or over the entirety completely. And so when we come to A to Z in the scriptures, uh, in the Greek it would be this way, from Alpha to Omega. Now would you look with me at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. Let me make sure I got my verse number correct. Yes, indeed. All right. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus Christ, here in Revelation chapter 1, calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And so this term or this name of God represents God as being the beginning and ending of all things. Now, the letter of Revelation is written to the seven churches uh, there in Asia Minor. Um, it is his revelation of the things that will soon take place. Now, here's the good thing. The book of Revelation is a book of worship, and we worship Jesus because he's the ultimate victor. When we come to the 18th and 19th chapters, we see Jesus Christ coming out, riding his white charger victoriously, setting up his millennial kingdom. And at the end of the book of Revelation, we see uh, this earth and the universe coming to a climatic, explosive end, and then him recreating a new heaven and a new earth for those who have trusted him and believe in him. And so this is a prophecy, a book of prophecy, about how all things from beginning to end 
are under the sovereignty of God. Now, I've been uh, in a systematic the uh, theology study with a particular man in the church, and I'm a few weeks behind with another man in the church, and we studied a very deep and a difficult section in uh, Louis Schaeffer's systematic theology called the decree of God, meaning that God has one plan. And what he was able to do, because he's sovereign, um, all-knowing God, is that he's able to see the beginning from the end. He sits above time because he's not bound by time, and he's able to take it all in. What a wonderful thing that he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We live in a chaotic world. We don't know where America is going as a nation. As born-again Christians, we're concerned that our country is dying and going to hell. Uh, we're very concerned about our, our freedoms, and that can seem very chaotic to us. But he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So this implies his eternality, his sovereignty, his um, omniscience, his knowing all things, uh, his omnipotence to work his decree, his plan, and that he is uh, our sufficiency from beginning to end. Now, there are uh, three ways in which we'll look here at Christ and God the Father being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end for us. So God is eternal, he is uh, infinite, he is sovereign, and uh, he has complete control over every aspect of human existence, our lives, and is the source of assurance of all things. Now, you're in Revelation chapter 1. You read just verse 8. Now look at verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, that particular phrase is added to Alpha and Omega. It seems a little redundant, but it's a clarification. It's an intensification so in the Hebrew, the uh, Hebrew letter that begins their alphabet is Aleph. Uh, do you know what their second letter is? It's Bet. Aleph Bet. Alphabet. Okay? And uh, so in Hebrew, it's Aleph, and the last letter is Tev, from A to T, all right? From A to Z. Uh, from Alpha to Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Um, I have not been able to research this as thoroughly as I wanted, but I've understood this week from doing some uh, preparation from this sermon that there are 18 instances in the Hebrew Old Testament where the letters Aleph and Tev are just together, and they don't make a word in Hebrew, and they don't understand where they are. The very first occurrence of this is in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Aleph Tev, created the heavens and the earth. He's the beginning and the ending. And uh, so there is this concept that God is all we need. So very quickly, let's just do this. Let's look at three things or three areas in which God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end of all things. So first of all, we understand that he is the beginning and the end of creation. So in Christ, in the book of Genesis, the Alpha of the Old Testament and the Revelation or the, the Omega of the New Testament meet together in this last book presenting to us man and God redeemed in paradise as the first book presented man uh, beginning in innocence and in God's favor in paradise, accomplishing finally what he began. So in other words, God created man to have a relationship with him. Because of sin, humanity lost that relationship. He interjected himself in the person of Christ to redeem us and to bring us back into that relationship. But humanity was designed to live in intimacy for all of eternity with God. And that's what Revelation presents, is that God's original plan at the beginning is now fulfilled at the end. And nothing stops God in his decree in what he has determined. So uh, we know in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
But did you know that according to 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, this is what's going to happen to the world that we live on right now. Listen closely. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all um, holiness and, and conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, that's believers, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So the evolutionary theory says it all began with the Big Bang. Well, that's a lie. God created all things just by speaking them into existence. But the Bible does say it does end with a big bang. All right? The elements, the universe, it melts with a fervent heat. Outer space is rolled up like a scroll. Now, we don't need to be fearful of that event because as Christians, we're in his presence. Remember, God is greater than the universe. The universe is material. God is immaterial. And if we're in his presence, then we're safe no matter what happens to the universe or to the earth. Then he does, in his goodness, create for the redeemed a new heavens and a new earth. That will be wonderful. I wonder what kind of animals will be in that new creation. Have you ever stopped to think about that? I mean, think of human exploration that has taken place throughout the millennia. We'll have a new earth to go explore. We'll have a new heavens to go march through. I don't think we're going to be tired or bored in eternity. <laughs> okay? There's going to be so much there. But nonetheless, um, it will be a perfect world, a perfect universe, a perfect earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The, the curse of sin won't be there anymore. We have a hard time wrapping our minds around that. All right, very quickly. He is the Alpha and the Omega of creation. Secondly, he is the Alpha and Omega of faith. Um, you can turn with me to your Bibles to uh, the book of uh, Hebrews. All right, so we forgot the couple of slides there. All right, here we go. Um, he's the Alpha and the Omega of faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he is the author and finisher, Alpha Omega, beginning and end of faith. You say, Pastor, I don't understand that. Well, listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. And if you don't know verse 10, you should turn there and look at it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created unto Christ Jesus. That word workmanship is the Greek word poema, where we get the English word poem. We are his original composition. God is an author. An author of life, he's writing your story. And praise God that it includes faith and salvation in Jesus through grace and faith. Amen? He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one who initiated love and brought his son into this world. He's the one who will bring us into his presence one day in heaven and will be with him forever. And faith will be no more because it will be sight. What a blessed and beautiful thing. All right, number three. He is the Alpha and the Omega of nations. Now, within our text of Revelation chapter one, 
he's prophesying in the verses before, verses six and seven, uh, about a coming event where he establishes his reign and his kingdom on the earth. But he's really, to a Jewish mind, reminding them of who he is in the Old Testament. These verses are based upon Isaiah 44, verse 6, Isaiah 48, verse 12. Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me there is no God. There are no other gods. He is the only one. Isaiah 48, 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he. I am the first and the last. So Jesus Christ is the first and the last. Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Has he become the author of your faith? I trust that you know him. He is going to be the eternal king. And he is the one who's going to usher in a new earth for the redeemed. Praise the Lord that we have comfort in Christ as our Alpha and Omega. Let's go ahead and close with the word of prayer.